Today, I'm going to go through The Storm by Kate Chopin and perform a cold reading, which is basically when I haven't read something before and haven't prepared on how to study or analyze it. And I just read it and start taking notes and start taking it apart to figure out what's going on. I, of course, have read The Storm before, but we're going to pretend like I'm coming at it with a clean slate as best I can. As we've done with other stories and with other methods like The Method and like Burke's Pentad, we first want to start breaking the text up into manageable bites, right? We can't swallow a whole steak at once. We have to slice it up. So we're going to start with a concept called defamiliarization. And this is something we haven't talked about before in class, but put simply, defamiliarization is the process of experiencing new or strange elements in a text. And I just made that up. There's probably a fancier definition out there, certainly better ones, but this is going to serve for us. And remember, a text, of course, can be a short story, a movie, a political ad, anything. There are multiple levels of defamiliarization, usually. And this makes the process harder. Process of reading and understanding. For example, if I gave you a Shakespeare play, if we had to read Hamlet, one of my favorites, then even if you've read it before, if it's been a while since you've read Shakespeare, you would experience first probably linguistic defamiliarization. And that occurs when you're, the very language is, language, right, is strange to you or unfamiliar to you. In the case of Shakespeare, that's modern English. That's not even Middle English. We could get into Chaucer and, and Middle English. But because Shakespeare uses archaic word order and phrases we're not familiar with every day, then it takes us a while to familiarize ourselves with the language. So we experience that sense of strangeness and it prevents us from really getting into the text itself because first we have to work through the language the same way that you'd have to push your way through a dense layer of undergrowth before you got deep into a forest and could really see what's kind of underneath the trees. With the storm, we do have some linguistic defamiliarization because we see words and phrases and speech patterns that we're not accustomed to. For example, Chopin frequently writes set stories set in the Deep South and in the middle of the 19th century ballpark. I could be wrong about that. It could be early 19th. Anyway, so time and place are another kind of defamiliarization. These are actually two different kinds, right? Temporal or geographic, but we often experience them together. Sorry, I had to make sure I got my, my reference correctly worded there. And we also see defamiliarization linguistically with Chopin. Not as much as with Shakespeare, or if I asked, uh, asked us to read Baudelaire, Le Fleur du Mal, in the original French or something, right? But we do see some dialogue that is slightly different. A very simple example is cutting the G's off when we know we're talking country, right? Uh, and then we see phonetic representations like this. No, she ain't got Sylvie which means she doesn't have Sylvie, right? So this is, this is ain't, which itself is, depending on whom you ask, a bastardization of isn't. And then we go even further to represent it phonetically like ent, as in, nah, I ain't, I ain't gonna do that, right? 
uh, I'm from Texas. I'm, I'm one generation away from a family that lived in trailer parks, so I am able to say ent with authority, just in case you're wondering. I'm not making fun of anybody's accent. That's my own childhood accent there coming out. The geographic defamiliarization occurs because this is in the bayou, and so we see Cajun representations, which of course is itself a blend of French and other things. And Bobineau, this name Bobineau, is one we probably don't see every day. So that's another kind of defamiliarization, right? That's linguistic. And then I'm going to call this one mm, ideological defamiliarization. And this is one that I just, again, I just made up. But ideology, of course, is a system of beliefs. And ideological defamiliarization occurs when we're reading a story and something happens that doesn't really fit with our worldview. For example, in the storm, of course, we have adultery. And the way that the story presents it is not very familiar to us. So an example would be, well, let me just write out the definition real quick. That's way too wordy, but gets the job done. So an example of this, of course, is in the storm. We see adultery presented in a way that doesn't seem to condemn it. The adulterers don't suffer negative consequences. There's no seeming system of karma or repercussion or judgment. Uh, think about as I've told you I can't type or write and speak at the same time think about the scarlet letter which I'm sure some sadist made you read at some point in your high school career I'm not a big fan of Hawthorne uh, but in the scarlet letter the adultery is punished. We do see characters suffer negative consequences seemingly because of these immoral actions that, that occur, right? But in the storm, we kind of have the opposite. There doesn't seem to be a negative consequence. The very, the, the final line. And so the storm passed. Well, now I've just, there it is. Talk about an anticlimactic handling of that. So the storm passed and everyone was happy, right? That is not a normal presentation of adultery. So this is ideological defamiliarization, seeing an idea that we normally would not see, the suggestion that there's no punishment for something like adultery, right? And because we have multiple levels, it can often be tricky to get into a text. This is why the first time you read the storm or as you began to read it, you might have thought, this is boring, or I'm not a big fan, or what's going on, what's the point? Maybe also when you got to the adultery part, you were expecting a certain outcome, but then when there were no seeming negative consequences, you might have felt surprised, angry, outraged, sad. Those are the typical emotions I see students experiencing. Together, levels of defamiliarization. I'm all, I'm going to pause it right there. I'm going to abbreviate it right there. Defam. Defam fam. Together, levels of defamiliarization can make a text impenetrable, right? This is why if somebody assigns you a, something by a really old dead white guy and it's, it's difficult in all of these ways, you get tired of it or you get bored with it or you get fed up with it or it's hard to get into it or your teacher's yakking on about it as I am now and you just find yourself rolling your eyes or daydreaming because there's that disconnect between what the teacher expects you to be thinking or feeling or getting out of the, the reading and what you actually are. Defamiliarization is the reason this happens. It's not just that you're a, a young whippersnapper, get off my lawn, no appreciation for art, yada yada, and the teacher's 
uh, old and crusty and doesn't understand Instagram or picked a life or whatever Twitterness is going on and they're old and don't get it and out of touch. Like those things are factors, but really there's a legit reason for this and it's defamiliarization. So I wanted to address that here because although we see defamiliarization in the chrysanthemums, for example, the storm is really the first one where we see these multiple levels coming into play all at once, right? So the antidote for defamiliarization is first to remain objective to deal with defamiliarization, remain objective, read the text many times, take notes, uh, interrogate your, how about I just hit the caps lock key instead of holding down shift, own assumptions of bias. I didn't realize that list was going to be that long when I, when I began it, so we're going to change the format here just a bit. And in fact, I'll just I'll just cut those needless words, right? This is how we deal with it. Now, this one especially can be a pain in the ass, but with the storm, it's only four pages. So, and most of the readings I give you are going to tend to be kind of short because I know you're busy. You've got a ton of classes. You've got a ton of other stuff to do. Um, you know, it's not, we're not in England in, uh, you know, 1778, we don't need to learn Latin and Greek and Hebrew and read entire novels. So you can read this text multiple times. If I was assigning, assigning you Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, yeah, it might be unreasonable for me to tell you read it twice in the week we have it or whatever. But something like this we can read multiple times, and each time you're going to see more, you're going to be less disrupted by those levels of defamiliarization. So if you want to make a good grade and you want to be able to understand, whether it's this or a you know car lease or a, a rental agreement or whatever, read it multiple times you'll be doing yourself a favor and remaining objective is important especially with ideological defamiliarization because the first response we often have to the storm is to think well these people are messed up they're they're lying to their spouses or they're either by omission or through action and, and there's going to be negative consequences to this even if there's not like a karmic judgment what if the spouse finds out you know what if the guilt gets to them there's all of these complications that come from adultery um, no matter how the story presents it that we could as readers think well what if bad stuff happens right so we have these emotional reactions and we need to be able to put those aside so that we can look at the story objectively. Now that doesn't mean your emotional reaction is not valid. It doesn't mean that your emotional reaction is wrong or right, but it's important that you suspend judgment and put your emotional reaction aside so that you can look at something as clearly as possible. Taking notes as I'm doing here, a good way to do it, whether you use notepad, whether you use a spiral binder, and and even if you don't end up being a note taker, I get that that's kind of an old-fashioned notion in some ways, and that's totally fine that it's old-fashioned. Um, it doesn't need to be around if it's not effective, but there is an effective way for you to manage information when you're learning in class, because class is often boring, class often seems pointless, you often have lots of better things you want to be doing. So the way to overcome that and make a good grade, of course, is either you have to process the information in some way. So whether that's notes on a computer, notes on your phone, notes written out by hand, recording lectures, and then listening to them in the shower, whatever, there is a method that will help you process information. And I'm not saying it's any one of those, but there is one out there somewhere. And taking notes will help you with these ideas of defamiliarization and help you understand texts better because you're interacting, you're taking a proactive role, you're starting to have almost a conversation with the reading, and that's important, whatever form it takes, right? So if we can do all of these things, then it helps us sort of get off on the right foot. And with the story itself, as we did with the method, it can be helpful to list important characters. So we've got Bobino. I'll see Calixta. Who else? And I'm just look, I'm just grabbing names off the text, right? Even if even if I don't know who these are. I've got BB. There's four names right there.
and we talked about treasure hunting earlier in class, and this is important here. I'm just going to treasure hunt through. That's a name. That's a name. That's a name. So any name I, I catch, I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe jot down. And just kind of as I go through, and that helps us build a the beginning of kind of a roadmap of the text. And once we've got these, we could work on relationships. Remember, we've talked about with Burke's pentad, the relationships between those five elements of the pentad. That's often where the real good stuff is when it comes to investigating a text. We've also talked about the relationships between elements in the method. So, for example, we come up with strands, and strands are often named after characters, right? Uh, and in this strand, we might have, or in this story, we might have an adultery strand. We could have a storm strand. We might have a marriage strand, for example. These are just major motifs that we see in the story, right? Uh, and right off the bat, you know that there's a conflict between adultery and marriage because by definition, these two things are typically incompatible and or problematic for one another, right? So this can kind of get us deeper into the story kind of underneath the surface. And once we have this list of major elements, we can sort of see who's doing what, why, where. I would say the, the storm tends to be a pretty good one for Burke's pentad. Because it's not that long, it may not be as good for the method because you're not going to be able to list as many repetitions. Think about if we had a story, a short story that was, you know, 20 pages. That's a lot more material to kind of sink our teeth into and build a list out of. But with something like the storm, and especially with Chopin, where events tend to move pretty quickly, her stories tend to have a lot of action or a, a lot of a big amount of concept packed into a small number of pages, right? When I say big amount of concept, I mean something as powerful as adultery. That's not something that you would normally, you know, just snap into. It would take, you'd build up to it, there'd be a lot of backstory, right? Sort of like death or marriage itself, some major uh, overwhelming factor or element. It takes a long time to build up to, but Chopin gives it to us in four pages. So that means the Burke's Pentad might be the better of the two heuristics we've seen, but however you interact with the text, remember, Taking those notes is important, and getting to these relationships is important. So when we talk about this in class, I'd like to hopefully get some input from you guys about these relationships. Um, who is doing what to whom? And I don't mean to be, uh, I don't mean to be innuendo-y there. Um, obviously, there's sex involved in the story, but um, this can be physically emotionally, etc. right? Remember ethos, pathos, logos. Why are they doing it? Uh, who benefits? That's not it. That's not Latin. Who benefits? Is it que bono? Anyway, who benefits? And then um, what are the effects, what are the consequences, right? Uh, and then, why do those effects matter? Notice, as we've talked about in class, I'm doing a who, which is a description, right? That's a journalistic question. And then a why, which is analysis. Then a what, which is description. And then a why, which is analysis. Remember, we're going back and forth between analysis and description, analysis and description, because we need to balance the two elements. We can't just have description. That's a book report, right? But we have to have enough description to provide kind of a foundation for our analysis. So let's look at some of these questions in class when we talk about the story and see if we can get into why we feel a certain way about the story and maybe what the story itself suggests about those feelings or, or how it sort of shapes our response.